The NBA draft is coming up in just a couple of days. It's this week on Thursday. Where are the local players going to go? What are the Hornets going to do? Plus, we head to the golf course in L.A. where Wyndham Clark wins his first ever major title. What a year he has had in the golfing world. I'm Luis Fernandez. He's Mark Bergen. This is WRL Triangle and 2. Let's just go ahead and get started. The jump straight into it with the NBA draft and the Charlotte Hornets. Uh, they have the number two overall pick, Mark. So let's get started with there. What do you think they do? Do they go Scoot or do they go Brandon Miller? I am in the Scoot Henderson Camp Lewis. I'm going to plant my flag here for several reasons, but I go back to when he played against Victor Wimbenyama, mano a mano in an exhibition game. He thought he was the best player on the floor. Now people are going to say, well, you're going to take the ball out of LaMelo uh, Ball's hands and both players are point guards. They're ball-dominant players. What I'm more so concerned about is how the two would potentially pair defensively. Can LaMelo ball match up against a two-guard at six foot seven? How do you match up against bigger backcourts? But you're a Hornets team that had the number two pick. You're coming off a season where you were 27 and 55. I'm putting LaMelo Ball's ego aside. I don't care if he's an all-star. Pick the best available player. I think that's Scoot Henderson at number two. Yeah, I think that's same best available player, especially, I think is kind of the key, right? Because the Hornets just have, um, they don't have a whole lot of talent. Uh, um, their contract situations can be a little bit tricky with some of their older veterans. Um, you're, you're trying to do whatever you can to keep LaMelo there as long as possible. Um, it, it would make sense to me to just say, let's go most talented player. Let's get Scoot Henderson. I think the, the fortunate part for the Hornets is they're in a position where because of just how this draft class shapes up, they are going to get a very talented player no matter what whether it be Scoot or whether it be Brandon Miller. Um, I hear both sides of that argument, right? Scoot, I think, is going to be the, the more talented player at, at this moment and I think um, has a lot of potential. I, the comparisons of like the, you know, he, he gets all the athletic uh, guard comparisons, the Derrick Roses, the Russell Westbrooks, the things like that. Um, so I, I totally get that. Brandon Miller, uh, I think, might be a better fit in the moment uh, and I, you see the brandon miller potential um there are some you know things you, you don't love obviously with brandon miller i mean whether it be like the off the field the off the court stuff um with what happened in alabama um or, or whether it be kind of how the ncaa tournament finished for him um he, he really did not have a good run there but you know at the same time it college basketball is such a different game than the nba um I, I don't know. I, I probably I'm leaning. I was initially very much on the Brandon Miller bandwagon. Get the guy that's going to be a, an elite wing an elite wing. that can shoot well, can do so much for your team. Um, but as we get closer and closer to draft day, I'm starting to see the, you know, third option floating out there, which is take this number two pick, take some of the, whether it be the veterans you have on the roster, yes. uh, the one of the five draft picks that you have in general and trade and see what happens there. Well, it sounds like you have some thoughts on this one, Mark. What do you think? Let's go to Miller really quickly at Alabama Lewis. And here's my argument against him. Take it outside of basketball. You have a new ownership group coming in. Now that Michael Jordan is selling the team, he'll oversee the team. Through the draft, the Hornets have five picks, by the way, too, which I think a lot of people forget. So you'll have other flyers to draft uh, wing players, which are needed in the league. But, okay, off the court where Miller didn't face any criminal charges, he didn't uh, miss any time, he was not suspended at Alabama, but he brought a gun that was used in a deadly shooting to a former teammate, and that happened. Now, why does that matter? You're coming off a situation where Miles Bridges also has off-the-court issues. So you have a new management group coming in. Do you want that, whether it's warranted or not, the perception, and sometimes perception is reality of having players with off-court issues, that to me to where if it's even close, if you're between Scoot Henderson or if you're between Brendan Miller, I'm just further adding to... Scoot Henderson's argument in this sense of if there's even a question, if it's even close, go with Scoot. And again, oh, well, we're going to upset the all-star LaMelo ball. You were 27 and 55 last year. So, but the, the trade possibility, <laughs> Lewis, the trade possibility. Let me ask you straight up. Would you trade the second overall pick for Zion Williamson? 
Yes. Like, I, I I understand, like, the concerns about, like, Zion's health and stuff like that. But, yeah, I absolutely mm-hmm. do that with the number two pick. I'm sure you're going to have to give up more than just the number two pick. But, like, it's a no-brainer. Mm-hmm. It's a slam dunk. Um, because if he can stay remotely healthy, he's you know going to be that generational number one overall pick um, just from a few years back that we saw play at Duke and, and dominate. So, I, yeah, I think it would be a no-brainer. If you can get him on the floor, I, I saw a stat on SportsCenter this morning, Lewis. Zion Williamson has only played in 36% of the possible games that he's been able to play regular season playoffs combined. So my number one goal would be let's get that number more than 50%. Let's get it above 50% to start. But when he was coming into the league, Lewis, and I understand he's a different player now. When he was at Duke, his lone season, and former President Barack Obama is flying into Cameron Indoor Stadium to see Duke and Carolina play. And the cheapest possible ticket is three grand to step foot in the building. He had the possibility of being a billion dollar athlete, and that's billion with a B. And there are only a handful in all professional sports. I'm talking about the Michael Jordans, the Tiger Woods, the Floyd Mayweathers, Uh, LeBron James, Cristiano Ronaldo, there's a few others that are worth a billion dollars and he has that possibility. He can be as good as he wants to be. You've got to surround him with a a veteran that says, look, get in shape. Your, your, Your livelihood is your body. Your tape is your resume. You can be as good as you want to be. This off court crap you need to get a hold of. Take accountability and responsibility in the best shape of your life. Because you're talking about the possibility of a player who could be worth a billion dollars. There aren't that many in sports, Lewis. Point blank, period. Well, and and that's the off-court stuff, obviously. I mean, with what happened this offseason, uh, WRL Triangle 2 is rated a PG podcast, so we can, uh, yes. we're not going to get into, the, into yes. that kind of stuff. But um, with, whether it be that or whether it be you know, just the, the health issues, that, that number about how many games he's been available for, I think is massive because I mean, if you're going to be trading up essentially like you have the opportunity to get a franchise player with this number two overall pick, whether it be someone in the draft or whether it be someone to trade for. So, you know, you, you need to make it count because having a number two overall pick like this does not happen very often, especially if you're the Hornets. Um, so I just, you got it. You got to make it work. Um, it would be a risk. It, like I'm, it's going to be a risk no matter what you do, whether it's depending upon um, a young guy in scoot or Brandon Miller, or whether it be, trying to go get someone like a Zion Williamson, whether it be like trying to go get someone like a Brandon Ingram, who's also dealt with health issues, but would be a great, a great fit and would work out well coming back home to North Carolina. Um, I don't know. I, I think at this point with Zion, I feel like it, he almost just needs to change of scenery. Um, I think that would be one of the best things that he could do. Um, so, you know, would the Hornets be able to help him? Would he be able to kind of make those steps to really tap into that potential that we've seen when he has been on the court, when he has been healthy? Um, I don't know. It's going to be one of those time will tell type situations. But I, if you can go get a Zion, especially, I think you go do that. Um, but if your consolation prize is Scoot Henderson, uh, who really um, the only major knock against him right now is what kind of, kind of his, his height a little bit, being only 6'2", um, and uh, his three-point shooting is not fantastic. But that, that's, you know, that's why you surround him with players like LaMelo, for example, who can hit from outside while he, you know, creates from the inside. So I I just, um, yeah, it, it feels like the Hornets are in a good position. It's just don't don't mess it up. That's that's where I'm at. Just, you got a lot of opportunities here. Just Just don't mess it up. If it were a different franchise, Lewis, I'd be more inclined to say, yes, go get Zion Williamson. But now that he has the big contract extension, it's like who on the Hornets roster or on their coaching staff or just in their franchise overall is holding him accountable day after day and says, look, young fella, here's the way that you go about conducting your business in this league. If you had another franchise like Victor Wimbenyama to the Spurs, he should be doing cartwheels that – He's going to get Dream the tutelage uh, of Greg Popovich and company in the nucleus that the San Antonio Spurs franchise provides its players, a track record of success. The Hornets haven't had that. They haven't had that in 13 years of Michael Jordan. Now, I credit him for buying the team back in 2010, $275 million. The reports are indicated that he sold it for $3 billion for the majority stake, but During his tenure, you've got, what, 
two first round playoff exits. Like it's not a hot take to say that Michael Jordan has not been a successful owner in Charlotte. So how this pertains to Williamson is yeah, for the talent, I would make the deal. I just don't, I don't trust the Hornets as an organization to say, if we do make that deal and bring Zion back to North Carolina, that they have the infrastructure in place to ensure that he succeeds. So then I'm thinking too, Lewis, of like what other trade possibilities are out there other than just Williamson. And it's like the Hornets have the 27th pick, the 34th pick, 39 and 41. There's no way the Spurs, even if the Hornets offered all that and the number two pick would give up the number one pick in the draft rights to Wem Benyama. Like I think you'd have to throw at least two other first round picks in there for the Spurs to entertain the conversation. Like there might not be a price that the Hornets could pay to get that pick, but is there anyone else out there in the league, whether it's a veteran, whether it's trading down to get more draft picks, like what other trade possibilities are there? Do you think for the Hornets? Yeah. I, I it, to me, it just, it feels like the Pelicans would, would be the home run for who want to have the trade with, because you have seen that smoke come up about the fact that it's, um, you know, oh, they really want Scoot Henderson pretty bad. And if you want to get Scoot Henderson, the only way you can guarantee getting Scoot Henderson is to have the number two overall pick. Um, mm -hmm. Whether that be for Zion or for Brandon Ingram, Brandon Ingram would fill that role that a Brandon Miller would. would I fill. wouldn't do so it for Ingram, Lewis. Sense. I'll just be honest with you. But I would not. Yeah, but would... the, the, no, the, the injuries. Yeah, the, the injuries with Brandon Ingram. That's that's what's so tricky. Um, so I don't know. I I mean, then you can kind of look around the league a little bit, right? Um you know, a team like uh, Portland may want to try and move off of Dame. I know there's been rumors floating around about what Dame would wanting to, it might be ready to leave the off season or leave the trailblazers this off season, but you know, they pick what th three. So they're going to get Brandon Miller, worst case scenario. Um, I don't know. It's, it, it's tricky. I, I think there are not a whole lot of teams that are going to be throwing everything at the Hornets for the number two pick just because they kind of fit and capital available to them. Um, Pelicans just make the most sense because they have multiple options that they'd be willing to do that. Uh, I don't know though. I mean, I, I just, I think if you do not live, there is a deal that you do not love, go take Scoot because he, I think, you know, you need a lot of talent and you, that's why you, part of the reason why you have five picks in this draft is because you know, you need that talent. So go, go get some talent, fill up your roster. Um, and just kind of go from there because it's the Hornets are not in a position where they're going to be competing, uh, you know, to make a deep run in the Eastern conference anytime soon. It's going to take a couple of years to build this team up to what it needs to be. So get started by adding talented players um, in key positions right now. We are recording this the afternoon, Monday, June the 19th. So a lot can happen. It is going to be interesting though, Lewis, the revisionist history, whether the Hornets hit on this pick, if they make a deal, However, this shakes out to say, oh, well, it was the new ownership. No, 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 no. Michael Jordan still has control of the team through this draft and through the start of free agency on July the 1st. So it's going to be interesting to see how we remember this moment in time where it's a real fork in the road for the Hornets organization. In the NBA, you want to either be really good or really bad. You don't want to be in purgatory. And the Hornets have been in purgatory for quite some time. So you got you to make a move. You got to make a move and try and get to a spot. Um, and no, Victor Wembanyama is going to be a Spur. There is, yeah, no. I, I think teams could – there's nothing the Spurs would take uh, to give up Victor Wembanyama. But – When the Spurs um, got Wembenyama, the top pick, I was surprised. Miller, they are just three of the many players involved. When the Spurs got the top pick, Lewis, I was surprised you could even wager on it in all seriousness, at least in other states. Yeah. You, there, there were odds out there, and that honestly shocked me. Now, you'd have to throw down some serious coin to make anything back, but I'm sorry. Continue. No, no, you're good. I, I agree. I agree. Um, But Scoot Henderson, uh, Victor Wimbanyama, and Brandon Ingram are only three of the many players who could go in the NBA draft this year. Uh, so we have a bunch of local guys who are have entered the draft process, who have an opportunity uh, to uh, hop in. So uh, let's go and go through some of the list of folks who we think could go early. Um, who we think go late, uh, who might have to try and find a, a team in training camp, things like that. Um, so, Mark, I'll, I'll give the floor to you. Uh, first rounders among the local NC State, UNC, Duke type guys, um, who do you see as first round picks? Let's start with Derek Lively the second. And I don't know if he had absolutely zero offensive game at Duke or they just said, 
we don't need that from you at all. We just need you to be a rim running protect protecting big on the defensive end. So like, I don't know if this is a game that he totally needs to develop or a part of his game where Duke just says, Hey, thanks, but no thanks during his lone freshman season, this past season at Duke. So that to me, seven foot one, he can run the floor uh, is a little thin. He'll probably need to fill out a little bit in the league, but he to me would be the most intriguing prospect just because seven foot one players who can run the floor like a gazelle, they don't come into the league every single day, Lewis. That's where I would start. Agreed. And I think some people are going to see the potential in Derek Lively if they can coach up his offensive game a little bit and fall in love. They're going to fall in love just with what they see on the defensive side of things too. Um, really, I think with Derek Lively, the question is, will he be a lottery pick or not? Uh, a lot of mock drafts I checked out, he was either in the last few picks of the lottery or in the first few picks out of the lottery. Um, so I, yeah, Derek Lively, he's been doing really well in terms of the, uh, the NBA draft uh, workouts and things like that. Someone is going to fall in love with him and someone is going to take Derek Lively right around that kind of mid first round pick. And then I think in my opinion, at least, I think the next guy to go off the board is going to be another Duke guy, Derek Whitehead. But the question with Derek Whitehead is where does he go? Because we saw a lot of interest and potential with Derek Whitehead early on, right? He was a top five prospect coming out of high school. Uh, he is incredibly talented. He's got the frame. Uh, he showed an ability to shoot well from the outside over 40% from three. Um, you know, he, he was able to play good defense. He, he's one of these guys that you're like, wow, you see all the physical tools. But I think the issue with Derek Whitehead right now is the health, the health side of things. Um, he had some injuries during this season that kind of held him back at Duke. We missed some time. Um, and he, according to reports, he had a, a foot surgery um, this month as well, or maybe it was May just recently. Um, and I know teams, NBA teams kind of get worried a little bit, especially when feet get involved. That's part of the reason why you've seen Zion be, um, you know, kind of taken care of the way he's been taken care of with the Pelicans. So um, that he's going to be to me a, a question. Mark. I don't know if someone's going to fall in love with him and take him near the lottery or if he's going to fall towards the back half of the first round and be an absolute steal for someone. Uh, but if, if Derek Whitehead can stay healthy, you know, sky's the limit for, for what he can accomplish in the NBA. Lewis, newsflash. Anyone who definitively says what Derek Lively will or won't be in the NBA has no clue because we have no idea. We have no idea. I don't think he was ever fully healthy at Duke. And that foot surgery you mentioned was the second operation he had on that foot. I don't think he was ever really healthy at Duke. And I don't really know what to expect coming into the league. He's like the great question mark. I have no clue what to expect from him. Like you could tell me he could be a solid three and D guy for several years in the league. You could tell me he'd be out of the league in five years. I have absolutely no idea with him. So he to me is like the biggest question mark of any of the players coming out from Duke or NC State in this year's draft. Well, and but that's to me, that could end up being something that benefits him, right? Because if he falls and ends up going to a franchise that has the sure. ability to take a risk, a, a risk on a player in the late first round where he can go and, and have the the someone will have the patience to work with him through, whether it be the injuries or whether it be like the more developmental things. I think I think Derek Whitehead could find himself in a very good position come the end of the NBA draft, but we will see on that one. Um, so we've mentioned two Duke guys, Mark. Um, now let's go and turn to, to NC State, who I think would have the the next guy and possibly the last local guy be taken uh, in the NBA draft in the first and second round, which would be Terquavion Smith. What 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 say you about Terquavion Smith in general? Anyone who can put the ball in the hoop can get paid and paid for a long time, Luis Fernandez. And I was honestly surprised he didn't come a bucket. out after his freshman year. Oh, yeah. Like, I was surprised he didn't come out after his freshman year, but thought he had a nice sophomore season, too. Uh, NC State had great guard play this past year with Smith, uh, with Jarkel Joyner, who we'll talk about here in a second, and then... Um, is that Morsel, their third guard, who is they had terrific guard play, but getting the Wolfpack back to the NCAA tournament, and this guy just found ways to score. Uh, again, another guy where I think he could fill out a little bit. I think as a young player, there are other veteran players who be able to throw their their weight around and be able to have their way to get to their specific spots on the floor. Um, 
but someone who I do think has a very promising career. He can be a solid pro for a long, long time. Uh, I was just surprised he came back to NC State after uh, I know he went through the draft process a year ago, didn't hire an agent, and then decided, hey, I'm going to come back and play another season in Raleigh. But if you can put the ball in the hoop, uh, is a role player, as a bench guy, there's always going to be a need for that in the NBA. Yeah. No, and it, yeah. Anytime you can have someone who can score, they're going to have an opportunity. Um, I think he has really underrated defensive instincts. Um, he, he was a lot better with uh, catch and shoot threes than his overall three percentage would, would um, indicate. Um, his ability just to kind of be a pull-up shooter, I think is also really great. Um, the one comparison I've seen have floated around a few times, which I think is a huge compliment to Kovian Smith is, is Lou Williams, who just retired. Um, and you know, Lou will was the, the epitome of uh, the epitome of six man, you know what I mean? So, um, I, I think if, if Turquavion is one of those guys who I, I feel is very interesting, I would, I'd love to see where his kind of career path goes. He, he I do agree. He, I would love to see him put on a little bit more weight. He's like, I think it's like six, four, one sixty four. So he's got the, the length. It's just a matter of, okay, let's get a little bit more, uh, meat on those bones, if you will. Um, but yeah, I, I think, I, I think Turquavion Smith is going to be a really good contributor for a team, uh, probably getting drafted. All of the mocks I've seen him have him in the second round. It's just kind of depending on where in the second round, but I, I think he could find himself in a really good position, um, to, to contribute early on. And then with Turquavion, I, based on what we are seeing in mock drafts, different kind of uh, NBA draft coverages. Dirk, Derek Lively, Derek Whitehead, and Terquavion Smith seem to be the only guys who for sure appear to be getting drafted from the local area. So other players like Jarkel Joyner and Leaky Black might need to you know, find a way to, to get onto a team in another way, whether it be kind of like the two-way contracts, working out through, um, you know, training camp, the summer league, things like that. Uh, so, Mark, any other kind of thoughts on those last couple of guys who may need to find another way to get on the NBA teams? Well, Leaky Black, I'm honestly surprised that he wasn't granted another year of eligibility. No, but in all seriousness, it seemed like he was on the Tar Heels for forever. Leaky Black, it's can you get with a shooting coach and develop catch and shoot ability from the outside? Because it's not every day that you can be six foot nine and move laterally the way that he does. I think the defensive ability, the athleticism is there. It's going to be the outside shooting for him. Is that something that he can develop as a pro for him? And then Jarkel Joyner is a little bit older than most of these prospects. Now, he had to sit out a year when he went from Cal State Bakersfield to NC State. Uh, back then the transfer rules were that you had to sit out for a year. So he's a little bit older as a prospect. Um, you know, can he develop into a true point guard? Again, another guy that we know can score, but you know, in, in the NBA too, everyone's going to be on the same level of athleticism as you. Can you, can you play with the change of pace? Can he create the space that he needs to get a shot, uh, to create space, to create shots, create space to, not just his own shot making abilities, but for that of his teammates as a pro as well, his passing ability as well. So, um, you know, you, you want to see them. It, a lot of it's fit. A lot of it's going to be their coaching and their development. And Lewis, I, I don't think it's something where with either of those players, it would be, you know, wouldn't really expect much from them as rookies, but two, three, four, five years from now, can they continue to develop as players in their career to where they go on and have NBA careers or, even if it look, you play professional sports at any level, Lewis, that is a tremendous, tremendous feat and a tremendous accomplishment. So um, we'll see if they end up hearing their name selected on Thursday night and the draft. It's one of the best days of the year, Lewis. I cannot wait for Thursday night. It's going to be awesome. It's fun. And hey, you know, for, for all these prospects, whether they be the first round picks, whether they be kind of later, it's we, we've seen in the NBA recently people who have come in um, later on in the NBA draft and contribute significantly. I mean, you know, Jokic was drafted during a Quesarito commercial in the second round. So like it, if it, it can be done. So it, yeah, it's really I, I mean, you mentioned kind of Jokic, Jim, Jimmy Butler was like the 30th overall pick. And those were the two top players in this last year's NBA finals. I mean, unless you want to say Jamal Murray was better than Jimmy Butler, but like, you know, Jokic, a second round pick and then Butler, a late first round pick. Um, again, you go to the right system, you go to the right coach, the right organization, you can develop. And like, look, those guys are more the exception and not the rule, but that's, 
that's all part of the intrigue and the mystique of Thursday night. And I just hope that I hope it's a chaotic night. I mean, like, look, Lewis, we're mentioning Zion before. Uh, by all reports, again, we're recording this on Monday. It indicates that the Pelicans are going to move off of him, and that could totally set off uh, dominoes. And I mean, we see Bradley Beal now has a new home with the Phoenix Suns. So, like, a lot can happen between now and then uh, in terms of shaking up what the future holds for this league as teams try to position themselves to say, hey, we saw a new NBA champion for the first time in several years now. Uh, I mean, I know the Heat have been in the mix the last several years, but with Denver winning, it's just like you get the right pieces, you get the right fit together. And um, again, Thursday night, you know when Benyama is going to the Spurs, but really beyond that, we th- there's – so much up in the air, really starting at two when Charlotte picks on Thursday night. It's like I'm going to be on the edge of my seat between now and then. Yeah, I'm, I'm pumped. It's going to be great. Um, and speaking of chaos and intrigue and all that kind of stuff, let's go and turn to the golf course out in L.A. Um, you, you know how it goes. Uh, the, the L.A. Country Club uh, had a, a fantastic showing there towards the end. Uh, Wyndham Clark and Rory McIlroy kind of battling it out. Rory ends up uh, losing to Wyndham Clark uh, by a single stroke. A, a really uh, fascinating end to the to the entire tournament there. Wyndham Clark winning his first ever uh, major. And before we get into just kind of like talking about what happened there, Wyndham Clark, my goodness, like someone who was barely making cuts, if that, for the majority of his career, has turned it around this year, picked up his first win uh, over at Wells Fargo, um, I think it was a month or two ago. And now he's, I mean, he, he did not play at the Masters. He missed the cut at the uh, PGA Championship. And then now he wins the U.S. Open. Your thoughts, Mark? I've got three things. Number one, I thought in the final round, overcoming the bogey on 15 because Rory got it within one stroke at that point. And Rory couldn't just, at that point, he just couldn't bury a deep putt to tie it up. And it was like, oh, is is the bogey on 15 going to end up costing this guy who's been in the league, uh, in the lead most of the day? So that was my first thought. I have two other things, Lewis, and I'll go one at a time. Uh, Ricky Fowler, who ended the game atop the leaderboard too, shooting a 75 in the final round, just point blank period didn't get it done in terms of shooting that final round. Um, I thought he blew an opportunity. And then third, I know the serenity of golf out on the West Coast. It looked terrific. You could see the LA sky or, or uh, uh, the skyline off in the distance and everything too. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Um, Lewis, one day I hope we get to have a show in person where people get to come see us in person. But like, are people just going to like hold up their phones the entire time? Like while we attend all kinds of events, like I know I'm very photogenic, but it's just like, can you not just soak in the glory of the present in the here and now and live in the moment? Like grab a quick (laughs) picture but like soak it and appreciate it. Like this is why Augusta and the masters will always be the best tournament. Like on 18 with Wyndham Clark. And it was a cool moment. Like everyone just had their phones out though. It's like, are they actually appreciating it for while they're there? Maybe people could better multitask. Maybe I'm being an elder millennial. That's where this, I'm at. This is this, this very much, it has like, you know, old man screams at sky or old man screams at cloud type vibes. I get it. I understand. Like I, when I go to concerts and stuff, I, I hold my phone up, I record, take a couple pictures and then I'm done and I pay attention. But, but no, no I, it, okay. I'll, I will, I will, I will allow you to have your soapbox to yell about people. Thank you. Phone. It's therapy so, for me, Lewis. Um, but it was, it was a great moment. It, it was. <laughs> That's good. That's good. It, it was a great moment though. Um, you know, I, I feel, I feel bad for Rory. I mean, I, the way he's just kind of had some near finishes, uh, near wins over the past couple of years at some of these majors been a little bit since he last won one. And then you, um, you mentioned his putting, which I think is huge. I was listening to uh, CBS sports's um, uh, golf podcast that they had. And I, I believe the stat that they threw out there is that he was averaging on Saturday and Sunday uh, about 40 feet of a uh, putting distance over the course of 18 holes which is all that for those who do not know math well, like me, that's just a couple of feet per, per putt essentially um, with the holes. So he was in a situation where he was making shorter putts, but he was unable to make longer putts. Um, And when you are trying to win a major, 
you, you got to have those moments where you make those long putts. Um, and, and you, Wyndham Clark, so much credit, just the way you mentioned the bogey, the, the way he was able to battle back, uh, yes. uh, and the way he was able to make, make any kind of bad situation that happened. And instead of it going terrible, he just made it okay. That's, that was huge for him. Um, and to, to see him have, he's 29 years old out of Oregon, I, I believe. Uh, so, you know, the way he's been able to just, um, kind of start to blossom this year has been really cool to see. Um, it's, it's always, uh, golf is more fun. I think when you have, uh, some really fun storylines going into, uh, Sunday. So it was a good time. It was a good time for sure. Mark, any, any last thoughts before we wrap things up? No, I enjoyed watching it on WRL and I liked that it started at five 30 as well. So I could settle in after eating dinner. It's father's day. I got to FaceTime with my old man. I had some chicken kebabs on Sunday it was a great way to spend my Sunday evening just taking in the serenity and the beauty of California. It, it was it was definitely um, it was something to get used to, like it going on so late at night, if you will. Um, but hey, listen, I I the more the more I kind of get older, um, not that I'm older or anything, but like the, the more that I uh, appreciate my sleep is maybe how I should phrase it. Uh, the more I, I really envy people who live on the West Coast who, you know, Sunday night football or whatever it is ends at like eight o'clock for them. I'm like, man, that's the Pacific Times kind of got it made. It feels like a bit of a cheat code. Uh, but anyway, that's going to do it for us here on WRL Triangle and Two. I'm Luis Fernandez. He's Mark Bergen. Uh, tune in. Oh, you got one more thing to add here, Mark? One more thing. One more thing. The U.S. Open for okay. next year. So June 2024, it's going to be in Pinehurst. It's yeah. going to be in our backyard, Lewis. So... Tickets are now available for this 2024, 2029, 35, 2041, 2047. It's going to be right here in our backyard, Pinehurst, Moore County, North Carolina, Lewis. So next year, when we're talking about it this time, it's going to be right in our backyard. Man, that that stretch of Hurricanes winning a Stanley Cup and then uh, having to go cover at Piners, that's going to be quite a, quite a stretch for WRL, folks. Um, speaking it into existence. Speaking it into existence. Um, yes. All right. Just one more time. That's going to do it for us here at WRL Triangle 2. I'm Luis Fernandez. He's Mark Bergen. Uh, you can uh, watch us on the 99.9 YouTube page. You can listen to us anywhere you get your podcasts or on WRLSportsFan.com. Thanks, y'all. We'll uh, see you next week. Have a good one.